is The Herd. Wherever you may be and however you may be listening, live in Los Angeles, iHeartRadio, Fox Sports Radio, no TV today, FM, uh, XM Sirius, Channel 83. So, uh, stories breaking as we start. Brian Winhorst on the Paul George, Jimmy Butler trades to Cleveland. Quote, nope, not happening. The Cavs were not generating enough trade interest in Kevin Love. So this is great, great news for the Los Angeles Lakers. The Cavs want Paul George or Jimmy Butler, but Chicago doesn't want Kevin Love, and that's their best piece, and Indianapolis doesn't want Kevin Love. They're not interested. What Indianapolis, what the Pacers want is a player and picks, and that's what the Lakers have. They now have three first-round picks. They're not giving up the two-pick and shouldn't. And they have two later first-round picks, and they got a couple of players. Decent players, not great players. So the longer the Pacers wait, the less you get in return. That's the way it works in trades. I mean, Orlando kept waiting and waiting and waiting on Dwight Howard. You don't get anything. Sacramento kept waiting and waiting and waiting on Boogie Cousins. You don't get much in return. So the only place this really worked, in my opinion, was Cleveland anyway. Because Paul George has said, I want to be a Laker. And so I think I think with Dan Gilbert, you'd roll the dice and say, okay, let's go Paul George, LeBron, Kyrie, Tristan, we can win a title. Big payoff. And, and we think LeBron can potentially, 50-50 coin flip on this, convince Paul George to stay in a winning culture, not go to a losing culture. So the only place it worked to me was Cleveland, and according to Brian Windhorst, not happening. Cavs not generating enough trade interest in Kevin Love. So, and once the season starts, forget it. Because th- then you'd have to bring in Paul George, and then all of a sudden it take you know, in the NBA, it's going to take six weeks to eight weeks. And, and by the way, what owner, what GM, unless you have a real chance to win a championship, maybe Houston would roll the dice, but here's the problem with Houston. Houston wants Paul George too. But Indy wants picks and a player. And Houston's only got two second-round picks. So it's drying up out there. Now, Portland, I think, is the best position to get a Paul George. They have a C.J. McCollum. They have two guards. Neither defends. Both are great scorers. And they have three first-round picks. But Portland knows Paul George is not going to stay in Portland. He's not. He, he, he's going to be playing the Lakers. He's going to be an hour 45 flight to L.A., going regularly. And so I think it's happening for the Lakers. And the longer Indianapolis waits, the longer Indy, the Pacers wait, the more leverage the Lakers have on this. That's the way it works with any negotiation. You lose leverage if you keep waiting and waiting because people know you're more desperate. So if I'm the Lakers, what would I give up, Max? I'd give up my two late first-round picks. And you got to get Jordan Clarkson and Randall off the books anyway. And then you go into the season with Lonzo Ball starting – um, you'd figure out a two some way. Um, then you'd have Brandon Ingram, Paul George, Brooke Lopez at center, and a young center right behind him. You could have a big lineup. You'd have Larry Nance Jr. off the bench. I know they like him a lot. I like him a lot. There you go. So it to me, uh, in, unless there's something unforeseen that happens here, it is all working. A little bit of patience. Listen, I'm for patience. Boston, I'm running out of patience with their patience. Uh, But patience can be a good thing. The Lakers now, over the course of two days, have gone from no leverage. By just being patient, the Lakers have gone from no leverage to leverage in 36 hours. Just by sitting here and waiting and being patient, the Lakers now have leverage on Paul George. Cavs don't have what they want. Houston doesn't have what they want. Portland's not going to be willing to do it. I mean, Portland's already got two really bad contracts and two... Guards that play the same way, they got to fix that thing. They're not going to roll the dice on Paul George. They're not going to roll the dice. I'd be surprised. if I I wouldn't do it if I was Portland, and I'm all for getting Paul George for a year if you can win a title. So here we are. The NBA draft is tonight. Adrian Wojnarowski will be joining us in 30 minutes. Woj is the story breaker in this industry. Um, You know, it's funny. I like De'Aaron Fox of Kentucky. But would I like him as much if he played at Vandy? or South Carolina, or Coastal Carolina, or Oregon State. 
Two of the three uh, Kentucky guys this year, I don't like. Malik Monk, I think, is going to be the first bust in this draft. De'Aaron Fox will be a nice player. I think Malik Monk's a bust. John Calipari is the best recruiter in college basketball. He gets really great players. Of his 39 guys he's sent to the NBA, 39 from Memphis and Kentucky, two any GM in the league would want, Carl Anthony Towns and Anthony Davis. The rest of them, a lot of head cases, a lot of immaturity, good players, not, not game changers, not guys you're building the franchise around. Carl Anthony Towns, Anthony Davis, every GM in the league would take both. And that's with a guy that knows talent and knows how to recruit. I see this morning that four of the projected top five guys are from big schools. And I'm just here to tell you, basketball talent comes from everywhere. You would think, based on recruiting, that Duke, Carolina, Kentucky, Kansas, Arizona, and Syracuse, and UConn would deliver most of the NBA stars. But in last year's first team, second team, and third team NBA all-star teams, the all-NBA teams, here's where the players went to school. San Diego State, high school, Arizona State, Texas, Greece, UCLA, Davidson, Washington, Marquette, Texas A&M, and USC. And I would say John Wall's Kentucky, I'd take Kyrie Irving over John Wall every day of the week. So the two Kentucky guys are Anthony Davis. I buy that, although I'd put him on the second team. And the other Kentucky guy, John Wall, I think Kyrie Irving should be in there. Just think about that. Last year's All-NBA teams, this year's actually, San Diego State High School, Arizona State, Texas, Greece, UCLA, France, Davidson, Washington, Marquette, Texas A&M, and USC. And you, look, you start looking around the league. Damian Lillard, Weber State, Chris Paul, Wake Forest. Jimmy Butler, Marquette, Paul George, Fresno State, Gordon Hayward, Butler, DeAndre Jordan, AM, Clay Thompson, Wazoo, CJ McCollum, Lehigh, Dirk, Germany, Mark Gasol, Spain, Porzingis, Latvia, Bradley Beal, Florida. It's almost like Alabama's running backs. You would think Alabama running backs, best in high school, best in college, would be great NFL running backs, right? Number one in high school in the country. Number one coming out of Alabama. T.J. Yeldon, Trent Richardson bust, Fat Eddie Lacy, Mark Ingram mediocre, Derrick Henry doesn't even start. Like basketball and football talent comes from everywhere. It is really easy to be seduced. I think the draft is going to give you, in the, the best drafts in NBA history, there's a bust in the top five picks. There's a bust in the top five picks. One of these guys is going to be a bust, and it's going to come from a Duke or a Kansas or a Kentucky. I mean, that's just the way it works. I mean, Andrew Wiggins and Joel Embiid, Joel Embiid and Andrew Wiggins, though, think how good Kansas is. Those are your two Kansas guys in the NBA now. Embiid, mm, like him, injuries. Uh, Wiggins, terrific talent, but no dog in him. You'll never win a title if he's your number one guy. He's got to be your two or your three. And he's really, really good. But he fills a box score. You don't remember a basket. He'll never take over games. It's not his personality. He's totally chill. Watched him live three times. Seen three years of highlights. Does not take games over. Just doesn't. So here we go. NBA draft tonight. And it's all these big schools represented. Here's one thing we know. There will be a bust early. And my guess is it's a Kentucky guy, Malik Monk. You look around the NBA right now, man, basketball talent, most of the great players did not go to Duke, Carolina, Kansas, Kentucky, Syracuse, UConn, Michigan State. I mean, look around. It, it really remarkable. So here we are, NBA draft tonight. To repeat, Brian Windhorst says the Cleveland Cavaliers getting Paul George or Jimmy Butler is simply not happening. The Cavs are not generating enough trade interest uh, in Kevin Love, who's a reasonably priced player for his production at $20 million a year. He's going to give you over 20 points and over 10 rebounds for the next few years, but um, he's not generating interest. And, of course, the question is now, that feels like, all right, so LeBron's going to go into this season knowing he's going to win the East, rinse and repeat, and get to the finals and have a massive matchup problem. 
Uh, it, it seems to me this is very good news for the Lakers this morning. Um, that, that, that the teams and the players that have the kind of, you know, Cleveland's going to roll the dice on somebody because of LeBron or they'll lose him. And, and the teams don't want Kevin Love. That's very good news if you're, if you're trying to get Paul George and you're the Lakers, it seems like in the last 36 hours you have gained not only traction but leverage. You know how much I love perky jerky? Eat it consistently and constantly. Now I have another meat obsession. They have their new 100% grass-fed beef sticks. Unbelievable. And a variety of flavors. Jam and Jamaican, Tasty Teriyaki, the original Pale Ale's great. Can't stop eating them. I challenge you, anybody, to find a better-tasting meat stick out there. And right now, a special offer. PerkyJerky.com, code HERD, gets you 40% off. I've always had a rule in sports. Fall in like with guys. Don't fall in love with them. Be able to move people. I mean, yesterday I'm arguing with somebody. Oh, you can't move D'Angelo Russell yet. Are you kidding me? A sucker picked up the Mozgov contract out of town. Amway, Amtrak, whatever, Greyhound, whatever. I'll pay for the ticket today, immediately. Thanks for flying United. If somebody picks up the Mozgov contract, you move whoever you got to move outside of the number two pick. But Phil Jackson's getting a lot of heat in New York because he is listening to trade offers for Kristaps Porzingis. Nice player, not transformative. It's just the Knicks have had so few good players in 20 years, people are going crazy like he's the next Patrick Ewing, and he's not. I like him. But here's what Phil Jackson said on some Facebook Live thing last night, and people got all worked up. We're getting calls. Um, you know, as much as we value Chris Stops and, you know, what he's done for us, when a guy doesn't show up at an exit meeting, everybody starts speculating on, you know, the duration or your you know, movability from a club. So we, we've been getting calls. And, uh, you know, uh, we're listening, but we're not uh, intrigued yet at this level. But uh, as much as we love this guy, you know, we have to do what's good for our club. What in the world is outrageous about that? As much as we love him, we have to do what's best for the club. He was on a live broadcast. He was asked questions. What's outrageous about that? As much as we love him, first of all, he can't defend a houseplant. He's been injured both years. He's a seven-footer that isn't really a dominating rebounder and gets pushed around near the basket. And you can't consider a couple of first-round picks and a starter from the Celtics for him? And he missed his exit interview, and apparently that upset Phil Jackson. I don't think I've ever had a player over 25 years of coaching, maybe 30, not coming to an exit meeting. Um, so it's, it's not happened to me. Um, I know it happens to other people and other players. Um, and his, you know, his brother and his agent have said, you know, Dom played it. But, you know, still it's a chance for a person to express themselves. And I had a real good relationship with Chris Dobbs over the last two years. So... It was kind of surprising. Just add all, the, all these things up. New York needs several pieces. Several. He's a seven foot two guy that's totally ineffective against size. Doesn't get to the free throw line. He's a poor, poor defender. Can't cover on the perimeter and gets pushed around on the interior. And last year he missed 16 games. He's been hurt at the end of the first two years. I like him a lot. I, I really do. But the Knicks need several pieces. If Boston said, we'll take Porzingis, we'll give you Jalen Brown, Jay Crowder, and two first-round picks, I'd do it in two seconds. That's four starters. If, if, if I could get this year's Celtic pick, Jalen Brown and Jay Crowder, I'd do it. I'm going to get two starters in this draft and then two starters from the Celtics. For a guy averaging 18 a game that for a size doesn't get to the free throw line and can't defend. You know, it, it's funny. New York does this all the time. Like, New York elevates players and coaches above what they are. God, Matt Harvey, Aaron Judge for the Yankees, Jeremy Lin, the entire 1990s Yankees. Shane Spencer was going to be DiMaggio. Carmelo Anthony, J Jabba Chamberlain, Mark Sanchez, Rex Ryan. New York has a history of doing this. I mean, New York City right now has one superstar in sports, Odell Beckham, who's never won a playoff game. I like him a lot, but I've said before, if you gave me a left tackle 
If you gave me a Pro Bowl left tackle, Tyron Smith for Odell Beckham, I'd do it today. They haven't had a good left tackle in years. And they got to replace Eli Manning here in the next couple of years. So, you know, Frank Isola was on the show yesterday, talked about what New York does to interesting young players. Look how we build up some of these guys. Look how we're already building up Aaron Judge. Look how we built up Porzingis. He hasn't won anything yet. The knock on him right now, he's played for two losing teams. So it's not a clear-cut home run like everybody thinks. And I think the perfect example would be Carl Anthony Towns, who's also played for a losing team. But I think that you would say that Carl Anthony Towns is a little further along yes. after two years than Chris Porzingis. I, I think what's happening to New York is they're starting to suffer from something that cities like Cleveland and Buffalo have. It's called low sports self-esteem is that you start overvaluing your players because you have no success. Right now, the Giants aren't a championship contender. The Jets are awful. Uh, the Knicks are awful. Brooklyn's awful. The Mets are underachieving. Yankees are interesting, but probably a little overhyped, probably still a year away. Don't have the pitching for the postseason. Um, and, you know, and your hockey teams are meh. So what happens in sports in America is you start getting low sports self-esteem. Now, Cleveland had it forever. They couldn't win. Buffalo's had it forever, and you just start overpaying for people. You get desperate. Like, you get really desperate. You want attention because you can't win titles. Buffalo's had this issue for 15 years. They overpay for everybody. A quarterback, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Tyrod Taylor, has a good exhibition season, and they, and they sign him in September or August to a long-term contract. Nobody does that but Buffalo. New York City, you wouldn't think would ever suffer from low sport self-esteem. But they're falling into the typical traps of cities that do this. They fall in love with players. I mean, Aaron Judd is, Judge is not going to have another year like this. If you look at the guys that get off to starts like this, Goulet, I hate to break it to you, it doesn't last forever. You, don't, you just don't hit like this forever. And, you know, Matt Harvey, it, Zach Wheeler... You know, these, they just fall in love with these guys. God, you, you'd have think Shane Spencer, you'd have thought was going to be uh, Babe Ruth. Take a deep breath. Porzingis is a nice player. I really like him, but he has injury issues. And by the way, I'll just, I don't have data in front of me, but when centers get hurt early in their career, bigs, because people aren't naturally built to be 7'3". I mean, they're just not. They have more feet problems and more back issues. Go look at Shaq. Dwight Howard, Andrew Bynum, Joel Embiid, Nerlens Noel, Yao Ming. When bigs get hurt in their first couple years in the NBA, Greg Oden, it doesn't get better. It, it rarely gets better. And so Porzingis missed, he missed a month. He missed 16 games last year. And he missed games at the end of the previous year. And he doesn't, he gets pushed around. And he's a really below average defender. And he wants to be a perimeter player, but he's seven two and probably needs to be closer to the basket. And you can't have he and Carmelo on the floor defensively at the same time. And he doesn't get to the free throw line. And he didn't show up for his exit interview, which is troubling. I would think it's something. And if people offer picks, I mean, all Phil Jackson said is, we love him, but we need pieces. You're not winning anything in the East with Porzingis. You got to get, if I could get a first round pick this year and two starters from Boston, I'm in on it. That would give you a, like the third. What would that give you? That would give you the third and the, in the 10th Lowry marketing at 10 third in the eighth. Lowry marketing who plays a little like Porzingis. You'd get him for cheap at the eight and at three, I mean, you can get Josh Jackson. I mean, so you'd solve your size issue. You'd solve your you'd solve your defensive issue on the wing, which you have with Carmelo. So yeah, I don't think that was outrageous. This is the Herd Podcast. Tonight is the NBA draft, and by uh, most predictions, and I think these are fairly reasonable, it is considered a good draft. You know, drafts go back and forth. We've had some real stinkers. The Victor Oladipo going number two draft. People knew ahead of time it was weak. Uh, the feeling is here is you've got uh, you, you're going to get talent here to the 15th or 16th pick. Now, you're going to have a bust in the top five or six. Even in good drafts, that's what you have. I question Malik Monk. That's my roll of the dice. But I like Lonzo Ball better than a lot of people do. So tonight, 
at 6.30 Eastern, 3.30 Pacific. The Vertical will have an NBA draft live. And the editors, Adrian Wojnarowski, it's Tom Crean, who was terrific on our show this week. Bobby Marks, who's been on our show, he's fantastic. Chris Mannix was on our show yesterday or the day before. By the way, wearing a leather jacket, awfully sporty. He was terrific. And here's Woj joining us. Big night for you guys. I'll be tuned in. Um, well, but- first thing, Colin, Mannix will wear that leather jacket all summer. It's it's unreal. That's almost sad, then. Yeah, it is. It is really sad. But, he, but but he's but he's outstanding at hosting our show, so <laughs> so we're keeping him. Let's start with this, um, Paul George. So uh, 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 Brian Windhorst, who we know, reports that they're not getting interest for Kevin Love. Okay. So does that make me believe that Paul George Lakers, the Lakers now in the last twenty four hours, have a little leverage with Paul George if he doesn't go to Cleveland? I do think the Lakers' chances have improved, Colin, over the last 24, 36 hours because I, m- my sense is that Indiana doesn't have deals that they absolutely love. I think they're hoping that the deal that they do between now and the draft, if they do do a deal between now and the draft, hasn't shown up yet because I think they're going through what they have right now. I think they'd like better. Uh, I, usually you always want better, but – they they want to try to get they really need to get maximum value for Paul George. You you just um a player of that caliber, you just have to get every asset back you can and and right now teams are unwilling uh in a large part to give up young players or draft picks, multiple good draft picks for a player they all feel is almost assuredly going to be a rental and then leave for LA at the end of the season. And and you you mentioned Kevin Love you know that is making i think the process for Jimmy Butler for Paul George more difficult for the Cavaliers because Kevin Love's value is not what it was when he came to Cleveland uh 3 years ago been and marginalized a little bit it yeah. has been it has been and it, it, the the league's changed around him a little bit too and and so uh his um while there is listen there's interest teams would love to have him you know i think uh Phoenix would love to have Kevin Love. They were interested in him in the past, but Phoenix isn't giving up the fourth overall pick anymore for Kevin Love. They might have done that a few years ago, but but not now. And it, it is interesting, though, Woj, because the history of this league, Boogie Cousins, Sacramento, Orlando, Dwight Howard, the longer you wait, as a general manager, Woj, you can lose leverage here. Well, especially in this Paul George situation, because um, every period with which Indiana waits, so if they don't do it by the draft, they're going to probably lose a little bit going into free agency. And if they wait for the season to start and they want to do it during the year, well, every game he plays in Indiana is one less he's playing somewhere else and teams are going to give up less. So I think their chance to get the best possible deal is today, but there has to kind of be a moment of truth in Indiana where they say, well, this might be the best we can do. We're going to have to swallow hard and, and, and trade him. Um, Or they may just be a little more defiant than that and say, we think we can be creative, find a way, and hold on to him longer. But I I do think there's pretty strong motivation, Colin, uh, within the Pacers to try to get something done before tonight's draft or during tonight's draft. Well, Houston has some players they'd part with, and I think they have the best players, potentially, Daryl Morey, but they only have two second-round picks. The Lakers don't have great talent, but they got two late first-round picks. Um, I mean, I, I, it's really funny. Somebody asked me yesterday, would you give up the two pick to get Paul George? And I don't even know why I said, no, I wouldn't No. see. I wouldn't, I, I like Lonzo ball that much. And I, here's the other thing Woj, that matters. LA is different. It's a crowded sports market. Lonzo is commerce and good basketball. Paul George is good basketball. I, I, uh, that's how it falls for me. Right. And, and the other thing too, is you have a player who. Um, has expressed that he wants to come play for you in free agency, who's going to be a free agent next summer. You're not giving away uh, the number two overall pick or Brandon Ingram. Now, if the if the Lakers are willing to give up either number two or Brandon Ingram, they would have already called this deal. That's the right. That's right. And so they're not. And and you, you mentioned they've got the picks now at 26 and 27. Um, or I'm, I'm losing. Maybe it's yeah. 27, 28, 26, 27, right? And um, uh, th- those are... Those are late picks, and so um, that might be the best they can do. And maybe at the end of the day, they do have to do that deal in Indiana, but um, they're not going to jump at that one. That that one's going to be one you you sort of know you have in the bank, and you, and you do it later. And you know, Indiana's got to decide. Julius Randle, if we were to take him on, 
um, you know, do we, he'll be up for his rookie extension this year. And, you know, do we want to invest 70, $80 million in him? They might, but, but at the same time, uh, I think they want, you know, for a player like Paul George, what they started out doing here, Colin, was they were looking for packages like Denver got for Carmelo Anthony, like Utah got for Darren Williams. And that's not out there for a player now who, who again, um, teams ex- expect is going to be a rental. Okay. Um, do you see the possibility of a big trade tonight? Would this be the one? <laughs> There's always the possibility of it. There is. But at the same time, you know, they're hard to put together. And, you know, whether it's Jimmy Butler in Chicago, as we talked about, um, uh, Paul George um, and, and others that may pre- may yet to present themselves, um, th- th- what I do know is there is a tremendous amount of activity. Utah is a team right now that's being very aggressive. They want to be able to put some more pieces together to show Gordon Hayward before they get to July 1. I think the Jazz are not afraid right now to reshape this roster in some ways, um, maybe even at the point guard position, uh, because George, George uh, Hill is a free, uh, unrestricted free agent. He could leave. And so I think the Jazz are being very aggressive now um, to, to maybe make some alterations to their roster that they feel uh, will help sell a contract extension um, a little bit better to Gordon Hayward, who, you know, they're very much in a, uh, a, a death grip fight here with Boston and Miami for him come free agency. Adrian Wojnarowski, NBA Draft Live tonight on the Vertical, 6.30 Eastern, 3.30 Pacific. Woj, Chris Mannix, Tom Crean, Bobby Marks. It'll be a great listen. Listen, regardless of how you think of Phil Jackson, uh, Porzingis is a good player. Had some injury issues, not a great defender, uh, but he's a player. And Boston has a lot of picks. I mean, a surplus of picks. At some point, they can't have all these picks. Are you? How surprised are you? I'm all for patience. I don't dip into my 401k. But at some point, Danny Ainge, has his last 22 picks have accumulated in no All-Stars. Wouldn't you think they'd be a little more aggressive if Porzingis is out there? Don't they need size? Couldn't they use him? They could, and they've, as an organization, they've always been intrigued by him. Um, I've been told they haven't fully engaged on that yet. A lot of teams are calling New York uh, on Porzingis. Uh, I, I think he's a unique talent. I think he is a special player. Uh, I think that you know people who thought he took a, a little bit of a step back this year, I would say, listen, there were some nagging injuries this year, but environment really dictated that. That was a toxic um bad environment as bad as there is in the league like in in the the way people used to talk about the kings uh the, the Knicks deserve that right now and that's the it's the kind of place nobody wants to send their players right now and here you have one of the best i would say maybe the best three players in the world under 25 years old Carl Anthony Towns uh Giannis Antetokounmpo uh Kristaps Porzingis um and you have him in New York in a league where no top players want to come to New York. You have one. He wants to be there. And uh, what Phil Jackson's doing now, even if he doesn't trade Porzingis here, he is. There, there's a um, you know there's a, a tremendous fracture in the relationship between them. They need this kid on their side. They need this kid leading them and, and taking them into um, you know through their rebuild here. And uh, they've done such damage to this partnership with Porzingis, who wants nothing more than to stay in New York and find a way to win in New York. He just wants a functional environment, and he doesn't have that there. And, and, and I don't think it's outrageous that he's demanding it, that, he, that he's, he's yearning for it. Uh, finally, Woj, um, it I feels like Fultz to the Sixers, he's a good fit and they want him. Lonzo to the Lakers, uh, I absolutely believe that's true. Uh, I hear Jason Tatum, Celtics. Uh, it's funny because I, I said when the season ended immediately, I'm like, I think Josh Jackson's the best player. <laughs> that was my takeaway. On Of all the players I watched, I'm like, There, he's there a- are many executives in the league who agree with you on that, Colin. There, 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 there are many who do. So he could fall to four? He could, and and I think there's teams trying to be aggressive to get up there to get at him. Who may some teams I just don't think have the assets. But boy, there's some there's some GMs I really respect in this league who may, who don't really have the assets to get up to four. But if you gave them their choice, they'd want Josh Jackson. This is a hard playing um, guy, plays with an edge, tremendous um, uh, competitor, yeah. and and that really attracts people to him yeah. beyond his skill. I mean, I think he's ahead of Kawhi Leonard. I mean, now Kawhi is or not. Yeah, Kawhi Leonard at this point is great. But if you went to Kawhi Leonard at this age, uh, Josh Jackson, you know, Kawhi broke into this league and, and offensively was a fairly limited player. Josh today, 
I don't know. I just I, I look at what the league's become where you need long athletic wing defenders. Like that's what Cleveland needs. That's what the second best team in the league needs. Uh, I think he's really interesting. So Adrian Wojnarowski, the vertical, he's their editor tonight, 6.30 Eastern, NBA Draft Live. Good stuff. Go to your phone. Keep working it, man. Colin, hey, thanks for having me. I always appreciate it. You bet. Take care. Catch the herd from noon to 3 Eastern on iHeartRadio and FS1. San Antonio is among those looking to get to number four to take Josh Jackson of Kansas. For what it's worth, the Suns went hard after Aldridge when he was an unrestricted free agent. Oh, good hell. If San Antonio can find a sucker to take LaMarcus Aldridge off their hands, I, I and, and, and yet Indiana can't unload Paul George, tells you the difference between the two organizations. First of all, LaMarcus Aldridge, let me pat myself on the back here. I told you when he went to San Antonio, what are they doing? Even great organizations like the New England Patriots make mistakes. They do. They make mistakes. Remember that guy, the defensive lineman, the Patriots got Albert Hainsworth a couple years ago, mistake? They let Richard Seymour go a couple years early, defensive lineman, didn't replace him for a couple of years, lost their interior defensive line talent. Everybody makes mistakes. LaMarcus Aldridge to the Spurs was a mistake. He's never hit, he's averages 19 points a game, and I can't remember a basket he's ever hit in the clutch in his career. I mean, he, there's nothing against him. He's probably a nice guy, but he's Sharif Abdul Rahim, who averaged 18 a game. I don't remember a basket. And I've watched both live several times because they both played in Portland. And I'm, you know, I mean, just ask, ask anybody in Portland. Damian Lillard will always take a big shot in the clutch. He likes to. Uh, Aldridge hides. And they'll somehow get to the number four pick. Watch. This is what they'll do. This is what they'll do. Josh Jackson, I think, is the best player in the draft right now. And I think with, like, Popovich and the Spurs, he could develop into a Kawhi Leonard-level player. And in the NBA today, long wing defenders, you can give them some offense. In today's NBA, God, an average offensive guy can average 16. Lonzo Ball averaged 15 in this league. Just because he has the ball, he'll have open jumpers. I mean, it's hard not. If you have the ball a lot in your hands, you're a guard or a wing in the NBA today with all the shots and possessions. It's hard not to average 14, 15 a game. Even if you're not a gifted offensive player, you can get there. So, there, listen, there's a sucker any minute. When you saw those mozgov Luel dang contracts, did you honestly think the Lakers could get rid of that with three years remaining on the Timothy Mozgov deal? $50 million remaining, and Brooklyn took it to get D'Angelo Russell, and they gave the Lakers a first-rounder and Brooke Lopez, who's got an expiring contract? Hell, I mean, you got to be kidding me. Somebody asked me yesterday, why did they give up on D'Angelo Russell? If you own real estate and you just have a house you know is not going to sell, the minute any sucker offers, you, you get out of it. Like, don't wait on a bad property. If you find a sucker, there's a sucker born every minute. If you've got a lemon and somebody wants to buy it, just eat it on what you have to give up. But if you can get it out of your garage, get it out of your garage. Mozgov was a Hummer that wouldn't start, and you got it out of your garage. And Brooklyn, okay, you gave up D'Angelo Russell. Maybe he develops into a nice player. It's not going to be a franchise guy in the Western Conference. So everybody in the world, every NFL GM, Andy Reid, the smartest guys in this league, Coughlin, Parcells, Bill Polian, Belichick, they've all butchered a pick. Greg Popovich butchered LaMarcus Aldridge. He, he, he doesn't want to make and take big shots. He gets passive in big moments, and he's really expensive. If they can get Phoenix to take him, oh, my God. Phoenix, what are you doing? You're, and this is what always happens with guys like Belichick and guys like Popovich. People let him off the hook. People let him off the hook. You know, they're trying to clear space for Chris Paul. Man, that, that is incredible. They're trying to get rid of Danny Green, by the way, too. Don't be a sucker for Danny Green. Danny Green works in San Antonio system. He's a nice little piece in San Antonio system. You put him in a Sacramento, he's dead. He's out of the league. So they're now trying to get rid of LaMarcus Aldridge and Danny Green, and somebody's going to bite on that, man. Somebody is going to bite on that. You watch. So that's Rick Buecher. 
San Antonio trying to get to number four to take Josh Jackson. I, I think Josh right now is the best two-way athlete in the draft. Uh, I wouldn't, I would, you know, depending on who I need, like Philadelphia now doesn't need Josh Jackson. They need points because they've got length and they got Ben Simmons to distribute. They need, they need a shooter and Fultz is ready to give you 18 a game as a rookie. And the Lakers, they need a real point guard. And what they need is to take a point guard who can elevate a bunch of C-plus players. That's what they really need, and I think that's what you have with Lonzo Ball. You know, and I'll, let, let me go into this Lonzo Ball thing. I like him a lot. I like Lonzo Ball a lot. UCLA averaged 77.5 points the year before Lonzo Ball. They averaged 90 when he arrived. That's a real thing in a stronger conference. By the way, two years ago, UCLA with Steve Alford as coach to average 71. The next year, 77. Lonzo Ball, 90. Okay, with De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk, two NBA guards, Kentucky only averaged 84. UCLA averaged 90. So I, I think he's going to be really special. Chino Hills in high school averaged 98 points. This year, 87 points. And they got good players. They have Division I players on that roster. They went down 11 points a game. UCLA goes up 10, 11 points. Doug Gottlieb says he'd put Lonzo Ball number one in the draft. Lonzo Ball is my number one player. That's who I take number one overall. Woo, I because like he bring, he makes you better. You want people that want to win, know how to win. And even though he has a funky shot, his dad's a pain in the ass, he won in high school, and he took a program that was completely dysfunctional, and they became probably the best watch in college basketball. And the, and best, and the best passing team. Passing is a lost art, and he is an artist. And the Lakers averaged 104.6 points. So can he, I mean, it, could he take them to 109? By the way, look that up real quick, John. If the Lakers went from 104 points last year and they just went, let's just say to 109. Let's say they, they average 109 and a half. So they go up five points. With, that's, all, that's all he's done in his career. Everywhere he goes, he takes the scoring average of the team up 10, 12 points. That's what he, that's what he does. So let's just do half of that for the NBA. So if, if Paul George landed, it may even – but let's just go up five points. He goes to 109. Where would that be NBA average points per game? I'm guessing it's upper middle, 109 a game. Okay, so there you go. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be a great team because it's still not a great defensive team. But if Lonzo Ball can take this roster, which will already be better with Brooke Lopez – all these other guys should be better because they're a year older. Brandon Ingram will be better. If Lonzo Ball can take you from 104 a game to 108, 109, you're, you're top 7, 8 in the league. All three hours of The Herd are always streaming on The Herd channel on the iHeartRadio app. According to a Nick source, I cannot believe this. This is exactly what I proposed. Frank Isola, according to a Nick source, Phil Jackson is asking for the third overall pick in tonight's draft from Boston, as well as next year's Brooklyn pick from Boston, along with Jalen Brown and Jay Crowder. That's what I said the deal should be. I would pull the trigger on that. This version of the deal would not include Boston taking Joe Kim Noah's contract. That's getting greedy. That would be an absolute home run. That's Phil's problem. That was a horrible con – that guy's been holding together on duct tape for three years. But if you if you listen, New York's a dead franchise. If the Knicks tonight, where's the draft being held tonight? Brooklyn. So your rival team in a city and the Knicks steal the draft tonight. The steal of the draft tonight, the most talked about team in the draft would be the New York Knicks, and it's held in Brooklyn's building on a dead franchise, and you would get the third overall pick with your eighth pick in the best draft in years. You're getting two starters in the draft. Then you'd get Jalen Brown and Jay Crowder, and Crowder's got a very favorable contract. I would do it in a sec. I like Porzingis. Two years, seven foot, two and a half, already been hurt both years. Now, I, I do think with Boston, I could have Kelly Olnick and Porzingis are my bigs. I've got Isaiah Thomas, Avery Bradley, Marcus Spart, and I think I can get Gordon Hayward. You put Porzingis, Horford, Gordon Hayward, Kelly Olenek, Isaiah Thomas, Avery Bradley, that's a really – Washington's done. 
John Wall's championship dreams are over. That's a real team. Gordon Hayward, Porzingis, Horford, Olenek, Isaiah Thomas, Avery Bradley, and that coach Brad Stevens, that's a real team. That is, that is vying for the second best team in the league. That would give Cleveland a real... You add Porzingis and Gordon Hayward to Boston, you got yourself a six-game series, seven-game series with the Cavs. That's a real series. Because Boston's bench is, is deteriorating. It ain't good, and it's deteriorating. I mean, Richard Jefferson and Darren Williams are probably done. And J.R. Smith at times looked done. And Channing Fry looks done. Wow. This is, this is, I would move, yeah, every, God, we've been in front of this. Stop all this whining about Porzingis. You have a dead franchise, and there's no guarantee you're re-signing Porzingis anyway. And Phil Jackson, this would be a crowning moment for Phil Jackson. If you can get the number three pick, that is Josh Jackson and Lowry Marketin, who's, you know, he is, you know, you could also go and get, if you thought De'Aaron Fox, you could get Jason Tatum. You, you know, you're that third pick. We know Markel Fultz going to Philly. We know Lonzo Ball going to the Lakers. You can go a lot of directions. You can go De'Aaron Fox, and you've got a starting point guard for a decade. And then, you know, who knows? You can get Jonathan Isaac. You can get I, – who would I take number three if I'm the Knicks? I think I'd go Josh Jackson. I think I'd go Josh Jackson. And then I think if Lowry Markadon is available – the kid for Arizona, I'd, if he's available. Jonathan Isaac for Florida State, I take him first, then I take. I, I, I Phil Jackson, I mean, Josh Jackson to me is Kawhi Leonard, but I think a, a little more advanced offensively. I really do. Kawhi Leonard went to two years of college, broke into the NBA, and couldn't score for two and a half, for two years. He wasn't really a scorer. His third year, he started scoring. His fourth year, he's a 20 point a game guy. So this is, if you're a Knicks fan, this is really exciting. What do the wise guys wear? I get asked that from time to time. The answer is the new gear from the HerdNow.com merchandise store. We are now officially open for business. We have all the apparel diehard Herd fans need to represent the show. Go to the HerdNow.com. If you don't, that's a you problem. And that's a you problem is one of our shirts. Check it out. The HerdNow.com. The HerdNow.com store is open for business today.